welcome everybody. Um, I'm Nick Stewart. I have been uh, a freelance ecologist for over 30 years. Uh, I have a particular interest in aquatic plants and, and aquatic vegetation. Um, and during that time, I've seen quite a lot of changes occurring to our aquatic plant flora. Um, uh, the uh, uh, knowledge of our aquatic plants is, I, I think, somewhat less than um, uh, uh, most groups of terrestrial plants. Uh, sorry, my screen is frozen. Here we go. Uh, Okay, um, and uh, that is because quite a lot of people are, find uh, aquatic plants quite scary. They're in, in a lot of different families from terrestrial plants and uh, a, lot, a lot of unfamiliar things. And uh, many, most of them don't have very showy flowers. Um, so this is part of a, a set of webinars that we've been doing for the Aquatic Plants Project. Um, hopefully making them a little less scary and, and um, uh, they're not as difficult as people might think. But just to, to show you, for example, uh, the map here is of a uh, small pondweed, pondweed and both pelvii. Um, and the, uh, the, the darker the red, uh, the more recent the record. And you'll see that there are quite a lot of uh, dark reds, but there are also, uh, 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 very many uh, paler colours, which uh, tells you that there are many, many records that haven't been seen for a good long time. And that could be, in some cases, that could be changes, but I think it's also quite a lot that people uh, are, are not comfortable about recording it. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, so the, the coverage is not as good as, it, as I think it should be. Um, so this is a, a, a sequel to a, a previous uh, a, a webinar that we did, uh, did uh, on the broadleaf pondweeds, uh, and today we're going to concentrate on, on the narrowleaf ones. But we just need to recap a few things uh, from, the, from the previous talk, uh, just to set, set the scene. Uh, so we're Talking about pondweeds, um, uh, most of them are in the genus Pondmigeton. Um, uh, those uh, old hands like me uh, uh, have, are just having to get used to the change of two species that have been taken out of Pondmigeton and put in Stachenia, but uh, we still think of them as uh, Pondmigetons most of the time. Um, uh, and there's also the opposite pondweed, which is the broadleaf ones, which we, we covered uh, last time. I will also be cover covering a, a nearby family, uh, the tassel weeds, uh, Ripiaceae, which includes two species, uh, because of their similarity to, um, uh, to uh, several species of pondweed. Um, for uh, books. The, the best book by far is the Pondweed Handbook. Uh, it's one of a set of uh, handbooks produced by the uh, Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, um, uh, which deal with aquatic plants. Um, it's an extremely thorough and informative book, and I would certainly recommend it. Uh, the, uh, another book that uh, produced by Botanical Society uh, is, is this book called The Plant Group. Uh, this is a book that covers some of the more difficult uh, groups of plants. Um, and uh, you'll find that for aquatic plants, it has some quite useful chapters, uh, including for pondweeds, there are one or two uh, where it's taken uh, uh, several similar species and, and compared them and, and highlighted the key characters. Uh, another book, uh, which uh, in a similar vein, but, uh, probably more comprehensive from the aquatic plant point of view, uh, is this book by Richard Lansdowne. Um, it's, um, uh, <coughs> uh, it, it's directed primarily at river plants, but there's a the lot of overlap and, and uh, it covers uh, effectively uh, anything you'll see in standing waters as well. 
Uh, and there's also a, a set of keys uh, which are available on the uh, Aquatic Plants Project website. Um, uh, this is the one for the narrow leaf pondweeds, but there are uh, several others on other, other groups, uh, uh, either families um, or sort of groups of similar leaf form uh, um, that, that uh, may be unrelated. Um, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> they're, they're designed to be to, to fit onto A4. And, uh, and and be laminated so that you can take them out in the field um, rather than dropping dropping all your books in into some lake or other. Um, so uh, pondweeds are quite a diverse group in terms of appearance. Uh, you get ones uh, with uh, big uh, floating leaves. You got big. big underwater leaves, these sort of rather glassy textured ones, uh, and there are various stringy looking ones and, and strappy ones. Um, and uh, at first glance, they look very, very different, um, but they have a, a couple of features in common. Uh, they have um, uh, staggered leaves. You see the, the sort of uh, alternate leaves. Um, you will sometimes get uh, two opposite leaves at the top of the stem. It's part of balancing it so that it can stick the, the flower out of the water. Uh, but the rest of the plant uh, all the way down will be alternate leaves. And the other feature that they have in common is they produce stipules. Um, and uh, stipules are uh, little sort of uh, uh, bits of tissue, sort of leaf-like tissue. Um, that uh, uh, formed at the base of the, the leaf stalk. Uh, and they initially start by protecting the stem, um, but they will open out later. Well, there'll be more about stipules later on in the talk um, <clears throat> because they are quite a, a useful, useful character. Um, but that combination of alternate leaves and uh, stipules, if you find that combination in an aquatic plant, you know that it's a potamogeton. Um, it, the, there aren't any other things that, that have that combination. Um, and the pondweeds are really divided into two main groups. There are the broadleaf ones, uh, which are, uh, they tend to be more than a centimetre wide, and they tend to be tapered at, at both ends. Um, so they're, they're sort of widest in the middle and, and narrower at, at top and bottom. Uh, and the narrow leaf pondweeds, which are par have parallel sided sort of strap shape or sort of stringy like uh, leaves uh, and up to one centimeter wide. Um, and it's this group that we're going to be talking about today, uh, the narrow leaved ones. Um, and so the narrowed ones, uh, there are actually 10 species uh, to think about. Uh, two species of Stachania, so they were part of uh, Potomac Eden until very recently. Uh, and we'll also be talking about the tassel, tassel weeds, uh, the two rupia species. Um, now, uh, this is more to, at this point, just to show that. Uh, all through the talk, you'll see um, uh, little markings, these blue markings, uh, uh, and just to explain what those mean. Uh, the the narrow pondweeds divide quite conveniently into pairs. Um, and uh, most of the pairs, uh, one of them has uh, stipules that are open uh, uh, and uh, with overlapping edges, and other ones, uh, the other one in the pair uh, usually has a, a, a closed stipule, i.e. a sort of complete cylinder. Uh, at least when they start off, they, they often burst out of the, uh, and sort of break open uh, in the older parts of the plant. Um, uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, so you do need to look at the youngest part, parts of the plant. Um, now, mostly you don't need to use that, that character, but it's just rather convenient to think of them in these pairs with one and one uh, and one and the other. So you'll find these markers and anything with a blue marker uh, 
uh, has an open stipule, uh, I mean, it's a, a, a sort of uh, overlapping um, circle, uh, ha has open stipules, and anything with a closed circle has, uh, has uh, cylindrical stipules. Um, so the first group of, of the pond weeds, which uh, uh, it actually is, is dealing with stachenia, the, the two that have been separated off, are very distinctive. Uh, and instead of having the leaf coming straight into the node, they have this, um, a bit like a grass, a, a sheathing part, uh, and what looks to be a ligule, it's actually part of the stipule, uh, and then the, the blade going off here. Um, the, the other distinctive feature of these is that the leaf is made up of two tubes rather than being a, a flat, uh, a solid lamina. Um, so if you if you break it open, you'll see that they're, they're rather fine, but you'll see just uh, two obvious tubes. <clears throat> so just to show you what the, what that looks like. Uh, so you've got uh, Stachenia pectinata here, uh, and you've got this sort of sheathing part, the leaf blade, as I was saying earlier. And this is what it looks like. When, when you pull the leaf away from the stem, you'll see that there's this sheathing part uh, with the, the stipule look, sticking out. Uh, it's very, very much like a glass, grass with a, a ligule sticking up, and this kink with the blade going off. Uh, whereas the more normal thing for uh, Potomogetans is that you have the leaf coming straight into the node and you've got the stipule sticking up uh, from that from that point. Um, now there are two species that have this character, uh, Stachenia filiformis and Stachenia pectinata, or what used to be Potomogeton filiformis and Potomogeton pectinatus. Um, and they have do have very different appearances. You don't need to know that one has uh, open stipules and one has closed stipules, uh, because that you can see quite easily just uh, by looking at them from a number of characters. Uh, firstly, the color, they tend to be, uh, filiformis tends to be a sort of grassy green, uh, whereas pectinata tends to be a sort of duller olive green. Um, uh, and there are differences in the leaf tip, the, uh, pectinata is, is much more pointed. Um, uh, and, but one of the more striking things is that Philiformis does all its branching at the base and then sends the flower up on a, on a stalk up to the water surface. Whereas pectinata uh, branches uh, uh, sort of fairly continuously. Um, so if we have a look at this in a bit more detail, uh, this one's filiformis, the slender leaf pondweed. And you can see here that, the, uh, that all the branching is here at the base. And you've got the, the uh, stalk, uh, flower stalk coming up uh, from that. Uh, the tips of these um, leaves tend to be quite abruptly pointed. Bit difficult to say whether they're acute or uh, obtuse, but compared to filiforms, uh, sorry, compared to pectinatus, the, the fennel pond weed, uh, which has a much finer tip. Uh, and the fruits is another good character if you've got fruit. Uh, the filiformis, uh, the fruit is quite fairly symmetrical. There's a slight sort of offset here. Um, and the, the, there's no beak, the, the sort of style just sort of sitting right on top of the fruit. Um, and if you compare that with, with the fennel pondweed uh, pectinatus, uh, you can see it's a much, much more continuously branched thing uh, and with much finer tips to the leaves. Um, and again, the, the, the seed is much more uh, asymmetrical um, and uh, there's quite a sort of prominent beak where, where the style comes out at the end of it. Um, quite similar to, to these, and with the same sort of sheathing base, uh, are the tassel weeds. So I'll go and uh, talk about these at, uh, at this point. Um, the main difference uh, is that whereas um, in the Stachenia, the Potomogetans, Pectinatus and, and, and the like, um, 
uh, the, there's a ligule sticking up, which is the stipule. You'll see here that there is a sheathing part, but there's no ligule at the top. So uh, you might have just little ears, but uh, there's no sort of bit protruding up, um, uh, looking, looking like a ligule. The other thing that's quite useful is that the tips of the leaves have these uh, quite, uh, you need a hand lens to see them, but the, it, quite distinct toothing to, to the tip of the leaf. Uh, but like uh, 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 the stichenias, uh, the leaf is, is made up of two tubes. Um, uh, so um, that, that's what you're most likely to confuse them with. Um, the, the two tassel weeds are exclusively brackish water species. Um, uh, uh, so the, the, the one that you're going to conf might confuse it because uh, the, of the stichenias, Stachenia pectinata uh, will also grow in, in quite brackish water. Uh, so that, that's likely to be the sort of what you're differentiating. And, and Stachenia pectinata has uh, very fine pointed tips, uh, whereas rupias have these uh, uh, obvious toothing. Uh, unfortunately, you do need to have fruiting material to, to be confident to, as to which, which rupia is which. Rup, uh, is which. Um, but uh, so you've got Rupia maritima, which is the more common of the two. Um, and the main differences between them uh, is uh, you see these fruits are very rather different from the uh, Potomogetans. So if it, it's fruiting, that it's quite obviously uh, a different, it's not a Potomogeton, uh, which has a very sort of clustered type cluster of, of, of fruits at the tip of the stem. Rupia, when it uh, starts off with a little bud, which is quite tight, uh, but as soon as it starts maturing, the uh, you get these individual seeds on, on, on individual uh, peduncles. Um, and these fruits uh, are, are useful, but also the length of this stalk to, to the, uh, to the uh, fruiting head uh, is, is also critical. Uh, and in Maritima, this is relatively short, it's still three centimeters long. Um, and the fruits are quite asymmetrical. As you see, there's sort of a different lean over to one side. Um, uh, whereas in uh, Rupia serosa, um, you'll see that it's got uh, a much more symmetrical fruit. And of course, uh, uh, the, other, the other thing is that you can, this is a very much longer uh, fruit, a uh, stalk to the fruiting uh, fruiting head. Uh, and you, uh, you can see also here, you've got this sheathing part, uh, and you, you sometimes get some little ears at the top, but it's not a, a proper ligule like stachenia. <coughs> um, Ropia cirrhosa tends to be in deeper water um, uh, and tends to be in more brackish water, but there's quite a lot of overlap, uh, and you will find them growing uh, at least in the same water body. Um, so that, that deals with the, 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 that group with the sheathing basis of the leaves. Uh, the rest of the ones that we're talking about today are flat leaf things where the, the, the leaf comes straight into the node. Uh, and you can see, again, we have different uh, pairs. We've got four species where the leaf is less than two millimeters wide and four species where the leaves are more than two millimeters wide. Um, and between, in those you have uh, on here, you have uh, two species that have very tapered leaves. So these are very narrow uh, but, and quite long tapered. And the two species are Potomitan trichoides and Potomitan rutilis. Uh, and then there's two species with blunter leaves, uh, which are Bertoldii and Pucillus. Uh, and on this side, uh, I'll show some pictures a bit later, but the, essentially the difference uh, between these two pairs uh, is that uh, in this one, you'll see that there are lots of extra sort of vein-like structures in the leaf. It's, it's not just a, the normal stained glass appearance that a lot, a lot of bottom, underwater leaves of bottom regions look like. Um, uh, but I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment uh, when we get to that. I'm going to work through these pairs uh, and just go into a bit more detail of, of those. <coughs> 
Uh, there are two which will come to the end. They're, they're, they're sort of more borderline as broadleaf ones. They tend to have leaves that are about a, a centimetre wide. Uh, so I do need to just talk about them, but uh, the, they don't belong in this main group uh, of skinny leaved uh, pond reeds. Uh, so we'll deal with the, firstly the, the two narrow, narrow leaved ones with taper tips. Uh, and the two involved here are Potomitian trichoides, the hair like pondweed, and uh, Shetland pondweed, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, and uh, yes, again, uh, uh, this, is, this is the one that has the open stipules, um, but you don't need to know that. There are some good characters uh, for separating them. Um, uh, for starters, uh, trichoides is, is a very green plant, whereas uh, 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 Rutilus is, is, is much browner in colour. Uh, but the other thing is that, particularly at the base of the leaf, there is, it has a uh, trichoides has this very strong midrib. Um, this this is a, a cross section through the leaf here, and you can see that that there's hardly any tissue, sort of normal, sort of flat tissue on either side of this very strong midrib. Um, so those two characters are, uh, will help to separate it. Uh, um, and, <coughs> uh, and, and in fact, th this is quite a good character if you're not quite sure if this is tapered enough um, uh, to, for comparing with Pucillus and Bactolia, which we're going to come to in a minute. Um, <coughs> The other one in this pair is uh, Potomitan rutilus. Uh, it, it has much more brownish color, it has rather stiff leaves, uh, and these stipules are really quite tough and papery. Um, uh, uh, and particularly if you have a dried specimen, they go rather sort of cloudy and, uh, uh, and they're quite substantial. Um, but uh, this is quite a rare species uh, and the other thing that sort of separates these two is that they have completely different geography. So the Shetland pondweed restricted to Scotland, uh, not in Ireland at all, uh, uh, and really quite a rare plant. Uh, whereas Trichoides uh, has a, a sort of quite well distributed in England. Uh, this is the uh, 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 Forth and Clyde Canal where it seems to be established uh, here or, or what has been in the past, you'll see that these are pale colors. So hasn't been seen there for a while by the, by the look of things. Uh, there is this one record in Ireland, um, uh, which is, has just been recently confirmed. Um, it may have been overlooked. There may well be other records that people know how to recognize it, um, but uh, it's only just sort of come onto the radar for Ireland. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll move on to the second group of these. So these are the narrow the ones with less than two millimeters wide, two millimeters wide uh, and with abrupt tips. Um, so the, the two in this pair are Potomitan Bertoldi and Potomitan Pucillus. Uh, and I'm afraid to say this is the one place that you definitely need to check stipules. The, there are other characters uh, which help to separate it, uh, separate the two, uh, but they're not reliable. And uh, so I'm afraid to say, uh, because it's not a, a, a character that you can do in the field, uh, but th this, this pair you do need to check, to see whether the stipules are, are open or closed. Um, uh, I've got pictures uh, coming up of, of these uh, nodal glands and the Turians, but. I don't have the air channel, so I'll just com comment on that here. Uh, th this is uh, particularly in, in Bertoldii, uh, along the midrib, you tend to have uh, quite prominent uh, air cells, much more obvious than in Pucillus. But it is a, a more than, less than character, so you will find some air channels on Potomac and Pucillus. So it's not something that you can use to, die, to, to be confident. But it is sometimes a uh, because there are uh, quite a few places where the two occur in the same water body. Um, so it, 
helps to have one or two field characters that can help to pull them apart. But because, because checking stipules is, is important, this is the time, I think, to discuss how to go about that. Um, so what your, uh, a number of tips to just bear in mind, uh, you need to choose a young bit of stem where the stipules haven't pulled away uh, because they will, uh, as, the, as the plant gets older, the stipule will pull away from the, uh, from the stem uh, and then you won't know if it's torn open or, or uh, it was, it was all, always that way. The place to look for the split, uh, uh, if it is split, it's going to be on the side of the stipule that's opposite the leaf. So uh, if you have the leaf on one side, you look for it on, on the other side of the stem. Uh, and the other thing to say is to look near the base of the stem because the upper part uh, will be split to some extent, uh, even in, in the, the ones that have cylindrical uh, uh, stipules. Um, there, there is a a split, and that's actually quite useful as we'll come to us in a minute. Um, for if you because you can follow it down, and then you can see uh, does it go, does that split go all the way down, or is it uh, sort of uh, just open at the top of the stipule and then becomes a, a solid tube lower down? Uh, there are various ways of, of checking stipules, uh, it's not difficult to do, but it's pro probably something that just you, you find what best. To, uh, that works for you. Um, uh, so I've got a number of suggested ways of going about it, uh, but it is just a matter of trial and error. And what I tend to find uh, is that people will suddenly get the hang of it. And, and yeah, from then on, it's easy. It, and it only, only takes, once you know what you're doing, it's, it's very easy to do. So the, the first way of doing it, which is, uh, uh, the way that probably Chris Pressman would do it, he's an experienced, bri experienced biologist, uh, so he's quite handy with the scalpel and uh, uh, things. I'm, I'm not very good at uh, making cuts with like tearing things, uh, so it, it, this, this is not a way that works terribly for me, uh, but uh, it is a good way of doing it. Uh, and simply what you do, so you've got the stem here, uh, with the stipule around it, so it hasn't torn away from the stem here. And you just make two cuts very close together, and then you just flip over the, uh, the things, uh, pull out the stem, uh, and what, what you see should be something like this. So here you've got a complete cylinder, uh, and here you can sort of see that the, we've got the, the one end here and one end here. So uh, the, it's an open stipule with two, two overlapping edges. Um, second way of doing it, uh, which uh, is just to make a single cut. Um, uh, uh, in the same place uh, and rather than sort of making a little sort of tube, a uh, sort of section of tube, uh, what you can then do is, um, is pull the, the stem a little bit out. Um, so that the, you can sort of see the stipule and the light coming through the stipule. And then if you feel around the cut end with the needle, you can sort of see whether it's open or, uh, or, or a complete cylinder. Um, the other way, which is, tends to be the way that I tend to do it, um, is, is that I just turn the stem so that the leaf is underneath, because then you know that if, the, if, there, if there is going to be a split, it's going to be facing you, um, because it's on the, uh, the split is always on the side uh, opposing the leaf. Um, and then just to prod around with the, uh, the, the stipule with the needle to see if the whole stipule moves in one Thing. So if you pull one side of it, does the whole thing move or just one side of it and the, the other side stays still? Uh, or you can, um, if, if you can see where the split is at the top, you can follow it down uh, until you, you get to the point where, uh, where it becomes a tube or if it goes all the way down, down you can see that it's split right, right, to, the, right to the bottom. Um, so I'm afraid it is just a matter of trial and error. Uh, 
uh, see what see what works for you, uh, how adept you are at sort of dissecting things under a microscope. Um, it, it's um, it, it's just a viewing microscope. It doesn't need to be a high power to to, to see it. Um, so, uh, move on to the other characters that I mentioned, um, uh, and uh, th this is another one that can be useful just as a guide. Uh, it's not a reliable thing, but it can be useful as a guide, uh, and that is that particularly in Bertoldii, you get uh, these sort of bulbous swellings where the leaf joins the stem. So you've got the, the leaf coming in here, um, and the stipule here, uh, and the, the main stem carrying through, and just at the intersection on either side, you get these rather sort of grisly, um, half translucent, uh, bulbous, uh, knobbly knees sticking out. And they tend to be more prominent in Bertolii than they are in, in, in Pucillus, um, but they do occur in both. So it, it's one of these more than less than characters than, than sort of, uh, so it's sort of judgment as to whether they're, they're prominent or not. But it's, it's again, it's a useful character that you can use in the field and then you can double check things when, when you get back home. But uh, especially if you've got uh, both of them within a site. Um, the other thing, and this is actually something that is reliable, you, uh, but it tends to be only in, late in the season that you can use it as a character. Uh, and that is that uh, along with quite a lot of aquatic plants, uh, they, uh, uh, these pondweeds produce uh, what are called chirions. They're vegetative bud buds that persist as green. Uh, they're sort of, uh, 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 and sort of settle on the bottom while the, the so you can see this is sort of a moribund uh, uh, group of a set of plants of uh, this will be Bertoldii. Um, uh, and most of the plant is just sort of beginning to rot away, but you're left with these uh, little sort of green buds. They're like sort of concentrated stem and leaves um, uh, and they will settle on the bottom and come the spring when the water starts warming up again, they will sprout from those, those buds. Um, and they are actually useful for, uh, in, in a number of species, they're a useful additional character. But the, here, because you've got this reliance on dissecting stipules, which isn't a field character, this is quite a, a useful extra character, but you need to do it uh, late in the season. Um, and th the difference between the two uh, is that in Bechtoldii, they're quite obvious fat buds. They're wider than the rest of the stem. Uh, these are ones in, 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 in Pucillus, and they're much less obvious that they're not just bits of stem. They're the same, same width as the, the, the normal stem, um, uh, as opposed to Bechtoldii, where they're uh, distinctly fatter and rather sort of bullet-like in appearance. Um, so it tends to be that these are the ones that are obvious and, and pucillus uh, turians tend to be much easier to overlook uh, and um, tend to be, uh, pucillus tends to peak and die back earlier in the season than both told I, um, which you may find that uh, it, if you find uh, a narrowly pondweed early in the season, it will quite often be puceless, um, but later in the season, uh, and sometimes in the same site, you will find Bertoldii peaking sort of a month or so later in sort of August, September, whereas uh, puceless will often be sort of uh, July, August uh, at its peak. Um, just uh, slightly going back to the trichoides, that does tend to be, um, a, a, a Bertolia tends to be quite obviously abruptly pointed. Pucillus, it can be a little bit more equivocal. Uh, this is still quite an abrupt point, but uh, as opposed to the tapered tip of trichoides. Um, but sometimes you can sort of uh, be left hesitating. So, 
uh, and particularly if you're in a place where trochoides is not uh, might be a new and interesting record. A good double check is to check the stipules um, because a pucillus um, has a, a closed cylindrical stipule, uh, whereas trichoides has an open stipule. So uh, you're not going to confuse trichoides and bactodiae because the, 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 uh, the, the tip of the, the leaf uh, is very strongly different. But sometimes pucillus can be a little bit more pointed than, uh, than uh, and a, a little bit more uncertain. Uh, and just some uh, uh, some real plants. We had a rather a lot of uh, sort of technical drawings, but just to see some real plants there. So we'll come to the the next uh, set of four, which are the ones uh, with the, the wider leaves, still quite narrowly. So we're, we're sort of talking about half half a centimeter generally, um, but we're wider than two millimeters. And again, we've got two pairs. Here, the distinction between the two pairs is whether they have these uh, extra vein-like strands. Um, they're called sclerenchymous strands. And the, what they look like, you'll see here, this is, the, this is one. And it looks like uh, these are actually air cells, just to confuse it. But you can see in, in this laminar part of the, of, of the leaf that there are these extra lines, <coughs> like a bit like veins, but they're not quite as substantial as veins. Um, uh, and they're called sclerenchymal strands. They're just basically stiffening, uh, make uh, sort of strengthening strands to the leaf. Um, uh, so uh, as opposed to the other pair, which is obtuse phase and freezei, uh, where you have, the, you have the main veins, uh, but there's, it's just a clear tissue uh, in between. Uh, so we'll deal with these these two first. So we're, this is uh, Potomitan of Chisophilus and Freesii. Uh, and yes, there is, we've got the uh, one that's got the closed stipules and one that's got open stipules, but this is not one where you will need to check the stipules uh, uh, because there are other good characters which, uh, which will help separate them. Uh, the, firstly, the tip, uh, Freesii has a much more obvious mucronate apiculate tip, um, whereas obtuse uh, has tends to have a blunted tip. Um, the stem is much more strongly flattened in, in uh, freezei. You can't roll it if you sort of try and roll the stem uh, between your fingers. Uh, obtuse folius will roll, it's, it's slightly flattened, but so it'll be a bumpy roll, uh, whereas Freeze eye is very strongly and sharp edge flattened. Um, uh, and the difference in the number of veins. Um, the stipules uh, also, there, there is a, a difference in appearance. Uh, uh, in obtuse failures, stipules tend to be sort of quite weak and floppy, uh, whereas in freeze eye, there are two strong veins on either side. And they will pull apart uh, and uh, sort of, uh, and the, the stick will, will tear in the middle. And what you tend to have is a sort of two pointy V-shaped parts of the, of, uh, of, of the stick. There's a misprint there, that's from stick. Um, so just to show some of the characters uh, a, a bit more. Um, uh, so freeze eye is predominantly five veins. So you've got the midrib and you've got the pet, two veins on either side. Um, whereas obtuse folius tends most of the time to be three vein. Very occasionally you will find obtuse folius with five veins, uh, particularly you, you only, and usually only just lower down in the leaf. But one of the, the, the things that if you do have ever have five, five veins obtuse folius, you'll see that the the branching, so you've got the midrib there and you've got the, the primary uh, side veins, uh, and the branching off from that is, is inwards towards the, the midrib. Whereas in Freezy, uh, you'll see that you've got the, 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 the primary um, side veins, and then the secondary is one come towards the outside uh, of them. So you can 
that's a good character for separating them uh, the, the, is the number of veins and, and the way they branch off. This has a much more apiculate point to the leaf, whereas Chis folius tends to be rounded. Um, sometimes has a bit of a point. <clears throat> so uh, just to show these again, this is sort of what it looks like in real life to, to the five veins. Um, uh, this one you can't really see, I think lower down, yes, you can see the, the, there's, a, there's a branch coming off here. So lower down the leaf, it'll be five vein, but at the tip it's, it is three vein, but <clears throat> you can see that, uh, and there's the one on this side branching off. So towards the base, that, that will be five vein. Um, Um, the other, just in general growth, uh, often obtuse folios will be quite clumped in appearance, um, but uh, uh, um, the, the stipules are quite floppy, uh, much more rounded tip, uh, sometimes has a bit more of a point to it, but uh, most of the time it's quite a sort of blunt tip. Um, so we come to the final group, which are the the ones with the narrow leaf pond reeds, uh, with, uh, with sort of broader narrow leaf ones, uh, and the ones with uh, and have these numerous vein like strands. Um, and there are two of these, uh, essentially, they're southern English. Um, you don't get them in Ireland. Uh, there's one record uh, for one in Scotland. Um, but uh, they uh, are essentially, you only have to worry about them in, in England and they're quite, even there, they're quite rare. So they're always good, good ones to find from the, uh, because of their rarity. Um, uh, and they're called, the, these extra strands, they're called sclerenchyma strands. Um, it's just strengthening strands, is a, is a, is a fancy word for that. Um, uh, and they appear as these far extra fine lines, uh, uh, sort of uh, ma making the leaf looking uh, generally a bit more cloudy. It's not that, it's quite the same stained glass appearance. Um, difference between the two uh, uh, is in the number of veins. So we uh, this is effectively three veins, sorry, five veins. Um, so uh, mid rib and two veins on either side, whereas this is. Uh, uh, tends to be, sorry, I got that wrong. Sorry, this is essentially three veins. So you've got the midrib and you've got one on each side, uh, whereas in compressors, you've got the midrib and two on each side, so sort of uh, four, I sort of phrase that rather oddly. Um, difference in the length of the flower stalk and the number of flowers in the head um, uh, and, and the number of uh, carpels in the, in, in the fruits. Uh, both of these have open stipules. That's why we've got the sort of marker with the, with the open stipules. Um, uh, a, I've got a picture of a fruit uh, coming up because the, there is a distinctive, if you have fruits, the, the cuspidus has very distinctive uh, shape to the fruit. Um, uh, and, and as its name applies, it's not particularly uh, sort of narrowly pointed, but it is much more pointed compared to, to compressors. Um, so the cutifolius in the name. Um, and there's a picture of the fruits, and you see that uh, it, this, uh, this is the normal uh, uh, potting eating fruit would be sort of the sort of straightish edge on one side and a curve on the other. But you'll see that the cutifolius has this extra bump which is very characteristic of it, uh, on this sort of short side. Uh, and then the finally compressus uh, has more veins to the leaf uh, and uh, a more abruptly pointed tip. Uh, and it tends to be greener in color as well. Um, the, uh, so again, we, uh, just uh, same characters, uh, more pointed tip, uh, 
three veins, so one on each side, uh, whereas compressors is two on each side. Um, so that's uh, is essentially it for the the main um, uh, the main narrow leaf pond weeds. Uh, there are just two others to mention uh, because they both have strap shaped leaves. Uh, but they're much wider. They tend to be a, a centimeter or so wide. Um, Christmas is a nice, easy one. It's the only one with these very obvious teeth around the leaf. Um, but you do have to be a little bit careful, particularly in winter. Um, the uh, tend to have not this obvious curve. The, it's, uh, its name's curled pondweed because because of this sort of uh, lumpy edge to the leaf. Um, it's a wavy edge of the leaf, uh, but particularly in midwinter, you'll get narrow leaf forms that look quite like obtuse uh, obtuse um, But the distinctive thing will be the teeth. That that's always going to give away Christmas. Uh, the other thing about Christmas, it like the narrow leaf ones, uh, it has a, a compressed stem, uh, which differs from the the, the other broadleaf ones um, uh, and actually it tends to be rather than just a sort of oval shape it tends to be slightly uh, indented on on either side you tend to have a groove <coughs> uh, on either side of the, the stem Um, the other one to, to mention here, it's an extremely rare thing. It, it does grows in a few peaty pools uh, are in, in the Western Isles, uh, called American pondweed. Um, uh, and it has these leaves, which are a sort of uh, around about a centimeter, but they're very long, strappy leaves. Uh, and the other thing is that when it does get to the surface, it produces a floating leaf like some of the broadleaf ponds. Uh, in fact, very similar to the leaves of the bog pondweed, uh, Potamine bargainifolius. Um, and these are opaque leaves that are floating on the surface. <clears throat> but you can get this growing in quite deep water uh, without the, the, the floating leaves. Um, uh, and one of the striking things that, uh, about it, as, as well as these long strap-shaped leaves, um, uh, is this very pinkish color that's quite distinctive. Uh, and quite consistent. Uh, as well as growing in uh, these pools in, in the Hebrides, uh, it does grow as an introduction in a canal in, um, uh, in Lancashire. Uh, so there's, there is uh, also a population uh, which, which probably brought in with sort of wool or uh, uh, to the, when, when they were active wool mills and some of these Lancashire canals. Um, the other thing is say, don't forget that Potomagetan natans, which you may well be familiar with, it produces a very obvious opaque floating leaf on the surface, but it has narrow underwater leaves, which you could confuse with a narrow leaf pomerate. Um, essentially, they're very solid, um, so it, they, they look a bit like leaf stalk, but without a blade on the tip. Um, but because we're so familiar with the, the broadleaf pondweed having these floating leaves, when you see it without the floating leaves, it can really throw you and you think, oh, heck, uh, what's that? But just something to, to remember to bear in mind. Um, so that's it, really. Uh, I think if you just approach it and just divide them into, into the, the possible pairs, uh, which is quite easy to do, and then just work your way through the characters that separate the, 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 the different species in each pair. Um, but I will say uh, that we've been talking about uh, Britain and Ireland as a whole. If we talk about, so th th these are all the species that we've been discussing, um, uh, and we're talking about sorry, Britain and Ireland as a whole. Um, uh, 
if you're just talking about Ireland, it gets a lot easier. Um, there is, you don't get folia, uh, sorry, uh, acute folius and, and compressus. Uh, you don't get rotillus. Trichoides, uh, extremely rare. So essentially, you're dealing with two narrow lead ones, both Toldi and Pucillus, and two slightly wider ones, obtuse folius and Friesian makes the job a whole lot simpler that you just have those four to, th to think about and also the, the the ones with the sheathing bases so uh, you have the stickenies and, and rupia but uh, it makes the job easier to to know that there are far fewer possibilities uh, similar thing in, in Scotland really um, uh, but uh, there is a, a bit more variety because you've got potting eaten rutilis, which is uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, uh, but you still have uh, acute failures and uh, you have one record for compressors uh, in the lock of a Boyne. Uh, one or two historical ones too, uh, but essentially uh, an extremely rare plant uh, that you don't have to think about most of the time. So again, cuts down the range of possibilities. Um, uh, England and Wales has most of the range of possibilities. Um, uh, the only one that's really missing is uh, a bottom eaten root of this. Uh, but filiformis is also extremely rare in England. Uh, you only get it uh, appearing right in the northern part of England. Uh, it's essentially a northern species. Um, as all of us remains to thank uh, the, the BSBI for uh, setting up this, this series of webinars uh, and particularly to the National Parks and Wildlife Service uh, for uh, funding uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, not just these webinars, but also uh, a number of the workshops that we've been having in Ireland uh, uh, and also to uh, Claudia and, and Nigel Holmes and Sally Peacock who provided a lot of the illustrations.